the first question maybe we could talk about is that you know, session and side musicians are forced to be flexible. They're forced to juggle a lot of different roles, a lot of different jobs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how each of your personal pie charts have changed over the decades and, uh, and what stayed the same? Do you think the change that you experience in your work is um, more or less than people who don't do this kind of work? Um, so maybe we'll start with Gail. Thanks, Jean. Um, it's my, oh yeah, it is up there. Um, I would have to look back. I've been with the city, New York City Opera for almost 20 years. And I would say basically my pie chart has been that for about 20 years, but that company is undergoing what many um, nonprofit performing arts organizations are undergoing, and that's like a major upheaval and pro possibly demise. So um, in a year from now, my chart is going to look like really different. The freelance performance portion of my income is going to become a much greater um, part of my income. And I've always kept up, you know, Jean, we were talking backstage before, and Jean's, we were talking about how you, you know, how you sort of direct your career. And, and I said, basically, it's really simple because I get called for something, I open the date book. And if there's a blank space, I fill it. I say yes. I don't really say, oh, I don't want to do that gig. Or being a bass player, frankly, in uh, Manhattan, I have turned down gigs on the east side a couple of times. Um, <laughs> but not because I was busy, because having to schlep the bass to the east side. But uh, now I have to schlep all over to the all five boroughs. I don't have that luxury of saying, oh, no, I got to go to the Bronx. I don't think so. Um, so my chart is gonna is gonna be a lot more strictly like freelance. My freelance orchestras, any touring gigs. I did a uh, two year sort of off and on tour with Philip Glass um, a year ago, and uh, I'll be open to a lot more of that that kind of thing. And fortunately, I um, still get called because I've always sort of maintained my freelance work in addition to my institutional work, which has been the City Opera and the New York City Ballet subbing, which I'm really grateful for. Dave? Um, thanks, Jean. Um, yeah, I moved to Nashville in 1977. Uh, by about mid-1979, uh, I began to, you know, really start working full-time as a musician. And uh, starting out, it was probably 90% live performances um, and 10% you know, uh, a few little recording engagements or things that I would do on my own. I had a, a touring job with a singer named Don Williams, who was a great guy to work for. I stayed with Don for 14 years from 1980 to 94. And over that time period, my pie chart changed uh, very uh, gradually but steadily towards uh, more and more studio work. Starting in about 1985, I started playing on Don's records and that sort of blew, blew up and, and I began to work on uh, a lot of sessions for a lot of different people. And so probably by the end of the 1980s, I was probably sitting right at about 50-50. And uh, in 94, I got off the road and went 100% full time. And over the next 10 years, I would say that, you know, a good 75% of my income came from sessions. But all along, going way back to the, to the uh, you know, mid-80s, I always did my own stuff on the side, creative projects that occasionally would find their way into the revenue stream. I've been putting out my own independent records since 1989. And over the, since uh, you know, 2003, 2004, as session work has begun to slow down, uh, really beginning probably in the, in the early 90s, I began to do a lot of freelance producing work. Uh, it was a consequence of, as I became a session player, I was always, you know, tried to be very observant of the entire process. I did a lot of work as band leader, uh, and it's just a lot of times the band leader or the session leader is the unpaid, uncredited co-producer. And so after a while I thought, well, gee, maybe I should just produce some things. And so uh, I, I usually do two or three projects a year. So sessions to producing income tends to vary year to year. But I think the chart that's up here is pretty emblematic of probably 2010, um, where I had a little more producing work. And um, when I took this second uh, job, or now it's my first, second, and third job, it seems, uh, as president of the National Musicians Union, uh, obviously my session work 
took a dip while I kind of learned the new job, but uh, fortunately in Nashville we are allowed to work in that field. And I find that when I get out and do sessions with the guys and girls that do that every day, they seem to get a kick out of the fact that the president is out in the trenches with them. So it's been a very long curve, and I, I think for me the overriding thing is opening up yourself to new opportunities. I've had a few cuts as a songwriter, um, and of course these little tiny records that I've put out have gradually built up, and these extra parts, uh, AFM After Fun, Sound Exchange, these things are becoming a larger and larger part of, of my pie, as it were. So, Gail, you work primarily in classical music, and Dave, you work in many different genres. What Gail was saying earlier about if somebody calls her and the calendar is free, she takes the gig, um, is that is that also how you work, or do you become more selective? How do you choose the projects that you take on? Well, I, I, I think that's the rule of, of all freelancers, is that you never say no until you're too busy to say yes. Um, and uh, for the most part, you do take something. Uh, you know, I, there, there are those who will knowingly take two or three things and then wait to see which of them is going to fall out and then cancel the other you know, and, and I always felt like that was pretty uh, disrespectful of the people who are calling you, so I always try to give an honest answer. And when I was balancing being on the road and doing sessions, I would just say, I'm booked. I wouldn't say, yeah, I'm going to be in, you know, uh, Nome, Alaska uh, that day. I would just, you know, I, I, I try not to take things that I don't want to take, but occasionally you do find yourself in situations where you, you make the mistake once, like shoving the bass to the east side, and you say, okay, I did that. I'm not sorry I did it, but I'll never do it again. <laughs> and in your case, because you are not only just a performer, but you're also pursuing your own kind of artistic projects, your own compositions, your own bands, um, how do you find balancing that? Well, you just have to do what you have to do to make a living and then try to cram it all in, uh, on, in the spare time. And I, uh, I have no life, so that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, for me, I think there was a lot of, of maybe uh, curiosity among some of my peers as to why I would do all these club gigs and why I would do this and that and spend all this extra time on things that weren't really making any money. And, and now, as, as the landscape has changed, these same guys that were asking me that question are now taking road engagements and doing more stuff. And I, I don't want to think that I was so much ahead of my time as I just felt like when you're playing for other people, your job is to be a servant to what they're doing. And, and I think as a, as a studio, any kind of freelance musician, whether it's live or studio, your job is to give people what they want. And when it comes to being a bass player, it's giving them what they want without asking too many questions because you discover very quickly that most people really don't care that much about the bass, certainly not as much as I do. So you learn how to do that. And, and then doing these other projects on the side kind of made me feel like I never got into that punching a clock thing. And I think some, sometimes people who only do one thing over and over again, it's inevitable, it's human nature, that you're going to get into that mentality of, well, here I am again, yeah, making up my own bass part, what a drag. And, and, you know, it's the most wonderful job in the world to be a session player. And so I never took that for granted, but all the outside things that I did have informed my work. And when I get a call for something that's outside the norm, or better yet, when someone says, hey, you know, can you do something different here? It's like, yeah, I can. And here it comes. How different would you like? And, and so, you know, for me, it, it all kind of, it's all part of the same picture. And I think if I was only doing one and not the other, uh, it would weaken both sides of, of that, doing what you want and, do, and doing what you need to do to make a living. So to me, it, it is a balancing act. And now I've got this third uh, element of, of uh, you know, running the union in Nashville, which had uh, been sort of in a bit of a rut for a while, and I just gradually became the spokesperson for those who were somewhat dis disenchanted with the way things were going, and one thing led to another, and uh, now I have my first desk job, but I've never loved playing the bass more, I can tell you that. <laughs> Gail, even though you do all of your work within classical music, there are probably some gigs that are more desirable than others. Kind of the way that we were talking about how you differentiate between the money gigs and your artistic practice, even in classical music for performers, that there are probably some, uh, some, some gigs that may feel a little bit more artistically fulfilling than others. And for you, do you feel like there's a hierarchy for you or do you just kind of take anything on? Um. 
I just kind of take anything on, but I really do appreciate the, the gems that I get, you know, and they're not necessarily high profile or high paying. In fact, many times they're just the opposite. Um, but they're really artistically challenging and like new repertoire and fitting into a new scene in a new situation that um, that's really rewarding. And if I could follow up on that too, I think something that every freelance musician understands on some level is it's really not up to you. You can do things to make the chances of your phone ringing greater but there are so many other factors, you know, and you can have an account, someone you've been working with for three, four, five years or more, and suddenly you're no longer on that account. And it's not because you did anything wrong or you didn't play good or, or you were, you know, uh, not a nice person to hang out with, which is a really important element of being a, a, any kind of freelance musician is what I call the hang factor, where, you know, there's a lot of very qualified musicians, but people are tend tend to want to hire people they want to be around. It's just human nature. So I, I, I do think that, that it's important to realize that, you know, if something like that happens, you know, it's really easy to take it personally, but it just means that the producer ran into a guy he used to hire years ago at the bar one night and was like, hey, man, I need to give you a call and the, or, you know, whatever. And, and so you have to learn to kind of roll with that. So a lot of the ebb and flow is not really under our control. We're just reacting to it. I think that was the point I was hoping to make. So we've talked a lot about your bread and butter, which is, you know, in, in your case, kind of session work, and then in your case, kind of performance, and you also do some performance as well. Um, but on your pie charts, there are other pieces of income um, that we haven't really talked much about yet, um, and it's especially for session players. Um, some of these pieces of income are less common for other roles. For the two of you, it's the A of M and After Fund, the Secondary Markets Fund, and Sound Recording Special Payments. And also, you mentioned Sound Exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about how that works um, and how the landscape for each of those incomes has changed over the last 10 years? How important are these income streams to musicians like you? Well, I think they're more important every day. And every year, that portion has been growing. And a lot of it is, as we heard in the previous panel, is, you know, as an independent artist, it's taking care of business, making sure that they've got all your information at Sound Exchange. Things that, um, you know, just making sure that you did get the proper credit for a particular session you played on, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, and also it ties into that whole metadata, um, you know, direction that things are hopefully heading but in the meantime you really have to look out for yourself I've had a little a few songs recorded by other artists uh, Chet Atkins recorded a song that I wrote called the day the bass players took over the world which he rather cleverly retitled uh, as the day finger pickers took over the world and uh, and that was a real thrill and it but it does get a little bit of airplay around the world and so when that money comes in it's not a lot but it adds up and it's the cumulative effect of this. And if you were to look at, at my pie chart from, you know, a few years ago, these smaller things would not have really existed much at all. The special payments fund is one that unfortunately in the current scenario is kind of shrinking because it's based on record sales and also the record labels being conscientious and paying in what they're supposed to pay. <coughs> and uh, sometimes they do that. Uh, so I think, you know, and, and, and one of the things that uh, with Bruce Fife, we're part of the AFM national leadership team, and one of the things that we're working on is trying to make sure that compliance is good, but there's also an element of the special payments fund, which for those of you who don't know, if you play, if you do a recording session in a certain year, you get credit for that session in this fund, which is paid into by the record labels. Unfortunately, you're not tied to a particular record, so if you did a certain number of sessions for an album that wasn't released, and then you did a certain number of sessions for a Garth Brooks album, your royalty payment would be the, would be identical. It, it, it really, it, it comes from the amount of work you've done in a five-year window that moves forward every year. And, and so we're looking at ways to kind of reinvigorate that, and part of that fund was the Music Performance Trust Fund, now called the Music Performance Fund which was designed back in the day when they were sure that record sales were going to destroy live music, which obviously hasn't happened. Um, that was set up as a way to, to ensure that musicians would be able to do these shows, which are you know, co-sponsored by this fund. And of course, the fund is also shrinking, and we're looking at ways to increase this again, because that's when musicians get out in the community, play in nursing homes, 
hospitals, and you know, a sense of community is, is so important to any city, any group of, of creative people. And so uh, the Special Payments Fund is, is uh, getting smaller, but it's still a very significant thing. And of course, musicians who play on films have a very different structure where they do actually get attached to that particular movie. So the 80 musicians that played on Titanic are sharing 1% of those profits. And so these things cannot be ignored, and it's all the more important to get the paperwork done correctly the first time because I can tell you many horror stories of films, film soundtracks that were done under false pretenses where they were sort of pretending that they were records that happened to magically fit this movie and therefore were not connecting that movie to the film secondary markets fund. Uh, a certain famous producers come to Nashville quite a bit to do some of these and the first one uh, you know, paid very well on the front end but nothing on the back end and the second film we were able to make sure that it was in fact filed as a movie, and the guys who played on the soundtrack to Walk the Line have made about $100,000 a piece on the back end out of that 1%. So there's your pie. <laughs> but you got to do it right, and a lot of it is keeping people accountable. You know, Harvey Weinstein isn't happy with 99% of the money. He wants 100%. And so we'll work on Mr. Weinstein and see if we can squeeze that 1% out of him. Did I say that? Sorry, Harvey. <laughs> Coming to get you. So both of you have been doing this for a very long time. Um, what are some of the lessons you've learned over the last 30 years or so? Like if you were to meet yourself like 30 years ago and be like, you're about to go into this business, here are some things that I kind of wish that I'd known, you know, when I was 30 years ago. And, and um, kind of what advice would you give yourself? Wow. Um... I don't think I would do anything differently as like crazy as that might sound, carrying a base around, not owning a car, up and down stairs in all kinds of situations. I wouldn't do it differently. I've loved what I've done. And, you know, what I would, you know, if, if I was wavering at all about whether I could actually do it and how to make a life in music, I would just say, just do it. Just go for it. Just do what you do. Just find your like-minded people, people you want to play with, people that um, want to play and want to further the craft of, of uh, instrumental music and just give it, give it your all. I mean, I think that's, that's pretty much um, what I would say and that's pretty much what I've tried to do. That's, I, I, I feel similar in that uh, you, you know, I, so many things have happened to me through just the sequential evolution of events and, and one door that opens that, you know, I never, when I moved to Nashville, all I really thought about was I want to be in a band. I want to be a band that, pe w that people know, that people like, that people will pay to see. And I hadn't really thought it through much further than that other than I knew I didn't want to get a real job. And, and so when I made the transition very gradually over a period of time, which I'm grateful for, to being a session player and then being a total freelance, all of those things happen in ways, I mean, I've had uh, so many of my dreams have already come true. I feel like that really anything good that happens from this point onwards is kind of gravy. But if I had to do one thing differently, I would have written more songs. I think that song, you know, Nashville is a very song-oriented town. I've had a few cuts, but, you know, you can write one song friend of mine wrote a song called Tulsa Time in 20 minutes in a hotel room in Tulsa. And it was recorded by Don Williams and recorded by Eric Clapton twice. And that's a pretty good 20 minutes. Uh, so I, I wish, you know, I, I tend to write when I have a reason to write. I'm making a new solo record. I'm producing somebody who really needs an up-tempo song that isn't a man basher. And I can help with that. So, you know, I tend to write from a goal-oriented uh, a, a standpoint, but I think that is, that's really the only thing that, that I would have done differently was maybe just cultivated a few more songwriting relationships, but also I think along the lines of what Gail said, the thing that I'm most grateful for is that I did learn to listen to my inner voice that said, hey, you ought to make a solo record with all basses doing nothing else, no other instruments, all basses. That sounds like a good idea, and I'm like, shut up, what do you mean? And, and in the end, I did those things, and 
I didn't even always know why I was doing them other than I was just motivated to try something different, to try to make a, a mark somewhere. And if, when you hear that voice, you have to listen because if you don't listen to that voice, it will go away. And I've seen far too many people that, that didn't trust that. And you know, if you can't trust your gut, other than when you've had a bad meal, uh, you know, who, who are you going to trust? So I think it's really important to absorb all this information, look at your environment, try to get yourself to a place where what you do could be in demand. Some of the things that I was doing on the base in Nashville, if I'd done them in New York City, I'm not sure anybody would have cared or it would have been thought of as anything innovative or new. But in my environment, they were like, wow, man, we've never heard anything like that before. Did you invent that? <laughs> it's like, well, no, no. That would have been Milt Hinton 80 years ago. <laughs> so you just, I think it's just following your heart and really, uh, you know, listen, because so many things have happened to me. I've found myself in so, so many unbelievable situations. And if I had not listened to my voice that said, buy that weird electric upright bass in, the, in 1981 when people looked at you like you were from Mars when I pulled this thing out and stuck it up on a stand. And then I, you know, about seven years later, I played on a record that had a prominent moment where that bass did its thing, and next thing I knew, my phone was ringing off the hook. But I never could have predicted that. So you just, you have to listen to your soul and listen to what's inside. And that'll be the last word. Please give our discussants a warm thank you. Well done.